Thank you so much for joining us here on News 12 for this special report on the coronavirus outbreak. I'm Amanda Bossard. And I'm Jessica Cunnington. Tonight we are breaking down this outbreak, what it means for the people here in our city. We do have an expert again in our studio tonight, ready to answer any questions you may have about the virus and how it may impact you or your family. The number to call tonight is 718-861-6827. And our expert here tonight is Dr. Zachary Pallas. He is the medical director of the Hebrew Home at Riverdale. And Dr. Pallas is also a board certified geriatrician. Thank yes. you so much for joining us this Thank evening. You. So much to talk about, especially regarding the elderly here in our city. So we're going to get to those questions in just a bit. But quick update tonight on where we are as the coronavirus outbreak continues to widen its grip on the state and the city as more and more positive cases are being reported. Right now, officials say that there are 216 total cases across New York State. 52 of those cases are here in New York City. And starting next Thursday, March 19th, SUNY and CUNY will begin what the governor calls a distance learning model, meaning classes will be held online for the remainder of the semester. The city universities, though, getting a bit of a head start on this, suspending in-person classes starting tomorrow through next Wednesday to give students and instructors time to transition to that. And this is all in an effort to reduce density at the nearly 90 SUNY and CUNY campuses and contain the spread of coronavirus. On Tuesday, a student at John Jay College of Criminal Justice tested positive for COVID-19. So that college closed today out of an abundance of caution. Officials say a large number of upcoming graduation ceremonies for SUNY and CUNY schools could also be canceled. Now, despite the CUNY and SUNY closures, New York City schools do remain open. Meanwhile, the MTA doubling its subway station cleanings. Transit crews, as you can see here, currently disinfecting stations each night will now perform a second scrubbing during the daytime. The authority's interim transit president, Sarah Feinberg, announcing the, that change last night, adding that at this point, trains will continue to be disinfected once every three days. So be prepared to see that happen as well. Near constant updates on the coronavirus coming from city and state officials and Dr. Powell. I'm sure it's something that's on the mind of many at the Hebrew home. So far, no coronavirus cases, though. Correct. At Correct. Center. Yes. Uh, no, no doubt this is uh, of a major concern. The media and we're, is covering it significantly, and it's something that's very much on the mind of all of our residents as well as their families and our staff as well. And what precautions have you uh, taken over at the Hebrew home at Riverdale to obviously prevent anything from happening since you are at zero cases? Of course, you want to keep it that way. And keep Absolutely. All of your members um, safe and healthy. So, I mean, our competent staff, uh, our medical staff, our nursing staff are very uh, adept and are really looking at, with a very razor sharp focus, any mm -hmm. patients who are developing respiratory symptoms. We know right now we're in the middle of flu season, mm -hmm. it's cold season, so there are a lot of infections, respiratory infections going around. Uh, we're very, very uh, careful in terms of identifying patients who may have any kind of symptoms. We're also aggressively addressing addressing the issue of infection control mm. in terms of hand washing, being sure that staff going round the clock in terms of in-servicing staff on how to wash hands properly uh, and making sure that they're washing hands when they arrive as well as before and after every patient contact. I understand you're kind of moving to no more visitors um, coming into the Hebrew home. Kind of describe why you made that decision and for how long you foresee that happening. Well, what we recognize is that the coronavirus isn't just going to develop at the Hebrew home, it's brought in. Mm -hmm. So our goal is to really stop it at the gate and be sure that there are no cases of coronavirus uh, and that, that stays that way and to be, to be extra vigilant in terms of screening all of our guests, mm -hmm. all of our visitors. Uh, and even with that, in, in an overabundance of caution, we've decided just to ban all visitors for now. Mm -hmm. uh, that way, really, really effectively preventing uh, any opportunities for the coronavirus to get into our facility. Yeah. Definitely better to be proactive in this situation, yes. as we can see. We do have some questions coming in. This was some, uh, from a viewer that we spoke to a little bit earlier today. So we're going to get to our first question this evening. So my question is, if you are one of those people who happen to work and go to school and maybe you have like elderly patients or something like that, is what we're doing right now enough to ensure the safety of those patients? I mean, if any other precautions are necessary, like do you, um, I just would like to know like what are those precautions that you can take? 
Sure. So uh, social distancing, maintaining a, a distance from people who are ill, mm -hmm. uh, and hand washing are two very significant evidence-based practices that have been shown to help contain any infection. I mean, those are good infection control practices. So that's really what we're emphasizing. Those are, those are the key evidence-based measures. That we can all do, yeah. exactly. whether you're in contact with patients or elderly or really anyone. That's kind of what we're trying to pump out to mm -hmm. any any New Yorker, exactly. no matter where you're Taking at. Taking those precautions. We do have a lot of questions that have been coming in really for the past several weeks on social media mm -hmm. as well. So we want to mm -hmm. get to one of our questions that came in through Facebook. And here it is coming in from Ro, uh, who's saying, is it safe for me to see my grandson coming home from college during spring break since there might have been two cases of the virus at his college, and I'm 75 years old. So given, given the infectious spread of the coronavirus and the fact that someone cannot be, it, it is quite conceivable that someone would not be symptomatic for several days, I would say to err on the side of caution mm. and to avoid that type of contact. Yeah. Uh, you know, particularly uh, with somebody who's 75, we know that the elderly can be and are so vulnerable. Yeah, and you know, like you are practicing at the Hebrew home now, you obviously can't have any visitors or family visiting mm -hmm. um, to visit family members. So just like Ro, you know, of course you want to keep in touch with your grandchildren. Sure. So you guys are kind of promoting, hey, maybe FaceTime a couple times a day, you know, exactly. to keep in touch. And absolutely. There's yeah, absolutely. other measures, you know, rather than just not speaking to them at all. Exactly. Exactly. You know. Yes, yes, and now technology is so easily obtained that uh, you know we're actually training our residents in how to use FaceTime and how to use Skype and mm -hmm. how to use various vi video teleconferencing. So it's been really good, yeah, in terms of that. Fantastic. Just for the time being, exactly. So we and get you learn this. a little something new yeah. in the process, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, hand sanitizer, antibacterial wipes, as we know, all hot commodities these days as people are flocking to the stores for those items. And some of those visits to the store could be done out of fear and panic among some people. So News 12 Shari Einhorn breaks down the differences between panic and preparedness. Oh my God, everybody is so crazy. You've seen the store shelves, right? Totally empty in some areas. And good luck finding toilet paper, antibacterial soap, or hand sanitizer pretty much anywhere. Panic mode in the store, me, prepared for two weeks, that's it. With so much talk about coronavirus, it's no wonder people are taking precautions to protect themselves and their families. Just been picking up what I need here, there, and everywhere. But experts say there's a fine line between preparing and panicking. This is tough to navigate. Jennifer Borquavis is a licensed clinical social worker and a disaster mental health worker. She says the stockpiling of things that may seem unnecessary, like toilet paper, is a way for people to have some control over a situation which is totally out of their control. Also, she says people are getting mixed messages. On the one hand, health officials are saying things are under control. On the other, they admit there's still a lot they don't know about this particular virus. People don't do well with mixed messages. People, I think by nature, do well with a black and white answer, and then they can plan. That's been tough to do, though. Several school districts closed with little notice. Some colleges are canceling in-person classes. The stock market crashed, and the entire country of Italy is now quarantined. This illness is a serious illness, but most people will get through it fine. That's been the overwhelming evidence from the world experience with this so far. Unfortunately, there are populations that are more at risk, especially older patients and especially those with underlying illness. So we're kind of in this point in time where there is this panic versus preparedness. What has the mindset of some of the residents at Hebrew Home been in response to this outbreak? Well, it's actually been remarkably calm. I mean, we have many mm -hmm. of our residents who are in their 90s. We have centenarians, residents in their mm -hmm. hundreds. Uh, and sitting down and speaking with them about it and what are their feelings and what are their fears, uh, they're remarkably calm. Uh, they've been through and they've seen so many different uh, epidemics and so many different uh, health issues throughout the course of their life. 
life. Uh, and it's really calming for us as clinicians, uh, you know, to see that from them. That's amazing that they have that mm. spirit. And mm. like we mentioned a little bit earlier, we can all learn a lot from yes. them exactly. and that mindset and that approach in the midst of this outbreak. And obviously education and awareness is a lot of it. And having people like you come on to reassure or direct people in the right, uh, to make the right decisions right. in an outbreak like this is, is great. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so good just to hear and see that they are so positive about just getting through this. You yes, know? It's yes. going to be okay. And you guys have done a great job at keeping things kind of business as usual as much as you can in mm -hmm. terms of the programming that you offer, bringing it floor by floor instead of maybe a big gathering. Mm -hmm. So that helps probably their mindset too. Exactly. Oh, but we still get to do our fun things. So. And they're, and they're so alive. understanding. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Fantastic. We want to get to another one of our questions from one of our viewers right now. How contagious is it really? Is it uh if you're on a train or whatever, would you actually catch it being next to people? Or how safe are you really in a room full of people? Yeah. Well, I mean, it is, it is quite contagious. Uh, and uh, the coronavirus, it's a novel strain, uh, the COVID-19. Uh, but the coronavirus itself is a cause, one of the major causes of the common cold. Right. So uh, if you are within uh, six feet distance of somebody who's sneezing or who's coughing, uh, it's conceivable that those viral particles could infect. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is, it is quite contagious. And you're in near constant contact with a lot of the agencies that are overseeing this outbreak, the CDC, the Department of Health, and that's probably mm -hmm. guiding a lot of the response that you're taking at Hebrew Home. Exactly, exactly. We've, we've, we're almost in constant contact with them and we receive guidance from them daily you know, regarding that. Mm -hmm. Which is good to know. Absolutely. Would you remind everyone out there that the phone lines are now open? A quick reminder that the number to call with your questions for Dr. Palace is 718-861-6827. A lot to be learned here this evening about this. And we say this every night because <laughs> we're here with a different expert every night, uh, someone in a different position, but we are all learning this at the same time. So feel free to call in with your questions and concerns. For Dr. Palace, we're going to be right ba back here on News 12. Welcome back to this News 12 coronavirus outbreak special report we have tonight, and we are here with Dr. Palace, who's ready to take the first question, caller of the night. We have Ruth on the line from Co-op City. Ruth, can you hear us? Yes. Amazing. What's your question? Yeah, I'm 77, and I have a homemaker coming twice a week. Are the home attendants being screened before they go out to the public? That's a, that's a very good mm -hmm. question. That's a very good question. And uh, the home attendant agencies are supposed to be doing their due diligence to be questioning uh, those home attendants, their employees, on a regular basis in terms of if they have any symptoms, if they've had any history of recent travel mm -hmm. to a foreign country or any exposure recently to somebody uh, you know, who is a person of interest uh, under investigation for coronavirus. Uh, of course, you yourself, Ruth, if uh, you see any sign of coughing or any type of respiratory symptoms uh, in that uh, home attendant, uh, it would be prudent, obviously, to, you know, to, to send her home uh, and to tell her to leave, but we would, we would hope that her agency would have screened them before that. Another very important piece of information is when she does arrive to work, uh, that you be sure that she washes her hands really well when mm. she arrives, because obviously there are so many germs that can be on her hand. Yes. Not just coronavirus, oh, but it's just yeah. a good infectious control practice. Yeah. Exactly. Something, a good habit to yes, have. For sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We want to get to our second caller of the night. We have Eric on the line. He's from the Pelham Parkway section of the Bronx. Eric, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Great. What is your question? Well, my question is, is that um, for people who are in nursing homes and they are, and they're like, you know, they put nursing homes and stuff, why am not the patients inside? If they get sick, really sick, and the nursing homes can that really like take care of the most major sickness that these people get sick from? How um, how are they going to be able to go to the hospital if they're banning people from coming in or out from the other nursing homes to go to the hospital to try to get better? 
So that's a great question. So we're, we're actually banning visitors from coming into the facility. Uh, however, if a patient is ill uh, and we feel that hospitalization is warranted, uh, you know, absolutely we would send them out to the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't that they're being uh, quarantined in place and forbidden from going to the hospital. So right. if somebody, if it's clinically indicated for someone to go to the hospital, uh, we certainly would send them to the hospital. And as you said, you're really trying to screen and anyone who may have any sort of signs of yes. respiratory illness and check in with them. I For mean, sure. more than usual. So mm -hmm. that also helps with that step. Under what circumstances would you say a hospital visit might be necessary? Right. So again, that's a, a work in progress and it's evolving from day to day. Right now, uh, if a patient just has mild respiratory symptoms, there are many reasons to think it could be other things in terms of a cold. This is flu season, mm -hmm. so we are seeing uh, a fair amount of influenza right now as well. Uh, if a patient uh, is declining, uh, if a patient, we feel that uh, the degree of their uh, illness, the degree of their symptoms uh, is uh, progressing at a more rapid rate, uh, and we are monitoring them, uh, then we would probably make the decision to send them out uh, if our index of suspicion of COVID were high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And would uh, you would send to the hospital to then obviously get tested? You would, I know, would it even be possible to do the test right there at the Huber home if necessary? So uh, that actually changed today. Okay. Uh, so it's good we're talking about it because up until today, if we wanted to get COVID testing, we'd have to call the state and wait for the state to send us the kit. And I believe it is effective today. Some of the private laboratories uh, will be able to do those testing uh, mm. procedures for us. So we would collect the specimen and send it to a private lab, uh, which would help expedite the process. Yeah. The talk of testing has been much of the conversation over the past few days. So to have that easier access to it, I'm sure, eases the minds of a lot of people Definitely. out there knowing that it's accessible. Uh, we do have another question from one of our viewers that we're going to get to right now. Well, how would we know that we have it? Or how would we know somebody next to us have it? Kind of a talk of those symptoms. Yep. What are the symptoms to look out for uh, on a daily advice? basis? Yeah. So, so typically it's symptoms which are consistent with other infections as well. So it's typically, it's a cough, mm -hmm. uh, fever, achiness. Uh, it can be GI symptoms, uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, although okay. that's less common. Mm -hmm. But typically speaking, it, it's cough, it's cold-like symptoms. Yeah. yeah. So just keep the lookout. And that's what we've been saying from the beginning. That's kind of all we knew from the beginning right. was the symptoms, the possible symptoms of coronavirus. So, And you were mentioning a little bit earlier in some previous discussions that these are things that you are accustomed to look out for, that flu season is something that you are always prepared for at Hebrew Home. So obviously it's a new strain of coronavirus, yes. but it's similar in its application in terms of preparedness. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. From the perspective of infection control, uh, you know, we, we, those are the symptoms we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that the elderly are particularly vulnerable. Uh, we've encouraged the, our, our residents and our staff to have gotten the flu vaccine, which is a very important step, and mm -hmm. it's not too late for others to get it still. But um, we are monitoring them, um, you know, and we recognize that common problems are common, mm -hmm. so that uh, it is more likely right now that we're seeing flu and we're seeing colds because it is cold season and it is flu season. So, but we're always ready for that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Top of mind, yep. Let's get to another social media question. Uh, again, we're getting so many, really on all platforms and obviously here live on TV too, but Randy has this question. I have high blood pressure, but I'm not old. Am I at risk? So, I mean, if you read the current CDC guidelines for uh, individuals who are considered at increased risk for uh, developing complications of coronavirus, mm -hmm. blood pr high blood pressure, hypertension is considered one of them, mm -hmm. as well as respiratory symptoms, diabetes, and un un other underlying uh, conditions that predispose people to infections. Definitely. And yeah. for those people, people population. right, right, and that just means, you know, be even more aware of the hand washing and social distancing. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, not translate it necessarily to fear, just more awareness, hopefully. Exactly. Yes. We're going to be right back here on this News 12 special report. Be back. Mm -hmm.
thanks so much for joining us for this News 12 coronavirus outbreak special report. We are so grateful to have had Dr. Pallas on with us tonight, answering your questions, especially regarding uh, the seniors and elderly people in our lives. And we really need to keep that in mind during this time. So thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Awesome opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about what precautions we should all be taking and specifically in relation to the seniors who are in our lives. Mm -hmm. So thank you again for joining us. Yeah. And if you do have any more questions, you can head on over to our News 12 Facebook page. We're going to have uh, addressing your concerns there on Facebook Live throughout the evening. Tonight's guests are going to be the Suffolk County Health Commissioner and a doctor who specializes in pediatric infectious diseases. And tomorrow night, right here at 7 o'clock on News 12, we're going to be sitting down with another expert on the coronavirus right here in our studio. Tomorrow, Dr. Rossi A. Hassad, an epidemiologist and statistician officer or professor at the school School of Social and Behavioral Sciences over at Mercy College will be right here in studio to address your concerns and take your live calls. And we will have an expert here every night this week, so don't forget, you can tune in at 7 o'clock. And if you have a question during the special, the number to call is right there on your screen. It is 718-861-6827. You can do that between 7 and 7.30 every night this week. And remember, we literally have all of the information that we've been getting on this and the constant updates that we've been getting as well all throughout uh, this outbreak on our website, news12.com. So make sure to stay with us here on News 12 on air and online for complete coverage as we continue to monitor the coronavirus outbreak.